Jesus Christ, look at that. Get in, get in, get in! This is going to be a big bang. There it goes! The end of Saddam Hussein. Communications were lost at approximately 8 a.m. Central Time this morning. And the whole front section of the bus has been totally destroyed by the bomb. He says there are, in his estimation, approximately a hundred dead bodies lying on the charred and smouldering floor of that gymnasium. The Queen Mother's coffin still draped in her personal standard. One tank is still to go. Let's hope to God that doesn't go while I'm standing here. So after more than five years and 47,000 hours of news, this is the final programme on the ITV News Channel. It's been a roller coaster ride. From September the 11th to the invasion of Iraq, the death of the Queen Mum to the marriage of Charles and Camilla, two general elections and countless breaking news stories. Over the next half hour, we'll be taking a look back at some of the big stories of the last five years and how we covered them. It was in August 2000 that ITN entered the 24-hour news market with the launch of the ITN News Channel, showcasing the best coverage from ITN's reporters working on ITV, Channel 4 and Channel 5. Former News at 10 anchor Julia Somerville presented the very first programme. This is the ITN News Channel. Dump the pump, driver's petrol price verdict. Concord crash, now French ground planes indefinitely. And born in a tree, baby Rosita's new plea for help. Good afternoon and welcome to the ITN News Channel. Well, I think we felt a bit like the crew of the Starship Enterprise. You know, we were on our own in space. <laughs> and um, we were going to have to survive and make the best of it. And I think that that bred an incredible feeling of camaraderie. And I have to say that... You know, as a presenter, you're very aware of the quality of the team behind you because, after all, you rely entirely on them. And I would say that there was always, from my point of view, a feeling that I'd got people who really minded and were trying to do a good job with virtually no resources. So I have enormous affection for that aspect of it and admiration and, and continue to do so for those people. And I'm really incredibly upset and angry on their behalf that they're losing their jobs. Well, people said we were sort of late to the market. Well, in a sense, we were looking at the American market, which was fairly developed for news channels, where there were effectively, at that point, three. There was CNN, the main channel. There was MSNBC. Uh, and there was uh, CNN headline news. And the, the gap in the market we saw was the headline news format. Now, it was obviously cheaper to do a headline news format, and that, and that fitted, if you like, the business plan. Uh, but also, we thought there was a demand. Well, in a sense, it was slightly overtaken by interactive television, which created its own on-demand service, for instance, the ability to on a red button on Sky. So, you know, that became, that's, that became sort of slightly out of date, and that's partly the reason that the channels change its strategy. It was little more than a year later that the ITN News Channel faced its first big test. What has occurred this afternoon is a declaration of war on America, a series of terrorist assaults that has left New York City and Washington and America in chaos. It is at a stroke, without even beginning to know the death toll, the most devastating terrorist attack in history. This is Manhattan. Images that will live along with Pearl Harbor in infamy. It began when a hijacked plane flew straight into one of the twin towers of the World Trade Center. Covered in dust from the debris, people emerged onto the streets of Lower Manhattan. While paramedics and police, utterly overwhelmed, helped the injured as best they could. Firefighters and emergency personnel. Others simply tried to run to safety. For some, it was a deep shock mixed with a single terrible and all-consuming question. There's people jumping out of windows. I've seen at least 14 people jumping out of windows. It's, it's, it's horrific. I can't believe this is happening. We heard a big bang. 
we saw smoke coming out and everybody started running out and we saw the plane on the other side of the building and there was smoke everywhere and people are jumping out the windows over there they're jumping out the windows i guess because they're trying to save themselves i don't know and and i don't know everybody just doesn't know where to go they won't let everything is blocked off you can't even they're telling us to get out but there's nowhere to go and then i heard that another plane hit and if you go over by there you can see the people jumping out the window they're jumping out the window right now oh my god I was on News 24 on September 11th, and undoubtedly that was the coming of age, really, of 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 the BBC News 24 and, and the ITV News Channel. Um, and it gave ITV as a channel, and it gave the BBC an instant way of switching that news onto air very quickly, and it was covered in a fantastic way by Sky and BBC and ITV. Um, and it's a shame now that, in a way, for ITV, they won't have that facility anymore so quickly to switch to people who know how to do 24-hour news at the drop of a hat. Hello, I'm John Suchet. Welcome to the ITV News Channel. Changing times and changing fortunes. In September 2002, the channel rebranded as the ITV News Channel, and within six months, we were carrying open-ended coverage on ITV1 of the outbreak of the Iraq war. Air raid sirens have been heard across the Iraqi capital. Actually, we can just hear gunfire now, Adrian, over the skies of Baghdad. I'm not sure if you can hear it there in Washington. These are the latest pictures coming into us now from Baghdad. We can now speak to our reporter who's still in the city there, Neil Connery. Neil, what can you tell us about what's happening in Baghdad? Well, about five minutes ago, we felt uh, two rumbles running through the hotel that we're staying in. Uh, it would appear that hostilities have now got underway here in Baghdad. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Those were the dramatic scenes that signalled the start of the war on Saddam, missiles hitting the heart of Baghdad. Good morning to ITV1 viewers and welcome to this ITV News Channel special programme. More air raid sirens sounding by the minute. A rush towards Iraq is gathering pace. We've been here for about 45 minutes and watched a steady stream uh, of vehicles, tanks, men, armoured personnel carriers going that way. I am travelling with British forces and literally within the last few minutes we have crossed from Kuwait into Iraq. We are now in hostile territory. We're getting word in from the Pentagon and they are confirming that what they are terming that shock and awe strike has begun. Ian, it's Mark Austin in Hello. Kuwait. What are you hearing and seeing? Well, Mark, I'm in the middle of what is a, already the most sustained and massive attack on the centre of Baghdad that we have seen in this entire uh, brief uh, war. There's no less than five or six major buildings that are now in flames. The entire city centre has been shaking with uh, massive explosions. Several buildings are on fire. There are plumes of dark smoke going into the night sky. This is going to be a big bang. This is on a completely different scale from everything else that has gone before. This isn't just an attack on bricks and mortar. It is an assault on the human senses. What can you tell us about that particular battle going on at the moment? Well, Angela, we're some distance behind British forces in the Kuwait desert, but nevertheless, uh, the sound of that uh, battle uh, going on um, is, is very clear. The artillery has been firing um, since dawn. We're crossing over now to look at live pictures that we're getting in here at ITN. These are ITV live pictures of British tanks going into Basra. This is the final assault. We've been talking about this for quite some time, but this is, uh, this is it in action. And these are uh, British troops going into Basra, live pictures that we have. I'm joined in the studio now by our military analyst, Colonel Bob Stewart. Each of these battle groups went in on main road axes, as you can see. And the live pictures we've just seen are probably, in my view, the reserve battle group, which is actually the 2nd Royal Tank Regiment, going in now. 
I am actually in the uh, northwest of Basra, outside a power station, which you can probably see behind me, which is where our battle group was sent because they see this as an absolutely integral part of the city. They want to make sure that the power supply is working so that the people can carry on normal lives. One of our reporters in Baghdad, Neil Connery, joins me now. Neil, tell us what you know of what is going on there. Well, Nick, it's a mixture of things, really. The first thing is the anarchy that is going on in the very city centre. As you say, with Iraqi forces uh, retreating, uh, there's a gap between where they are and where the US forces are. It's in those kind of areas that we're seeing a, a lot of looting here this morning. We've been seeing pictures of what looked to me like armoured uh, personnel carriers full of American soldiers moving into the city, clouds of dust, but also crowds of people. Neil, I just interrupted, we're seeing pictures of a man taking his shoe off and whacking a picture of Saddam Hussein. Absolutely giving it a bashing, and another chap is doing things I don't really want to talk about on national television to it. Within the past hour, I can confirm I've met American soldiers from the first Marine Expeditionary Force on the streets of the Iraqi capital. Ironically, they were guarding the Canal Hotel, which was the headquarters for the UN weapons inspectors. How you doing? My name's John Irvine. Sergeant Kamona, how you doing? From ITN. Nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. Sergeant, you yes, yes, sir. Welcome to Baghdad. This is the decisive moment. They're showing the Iraqis they're in charge. They can come in with impunity. There is no resistance. There is no small arms fire. It is effectively all over. The efforts by the local population to remove and topple that statue of Saddam Hussein is now being helped by the US Marines. Three, two, one. There it goes. The end of Saddam Hussein. One last pull. Goodbye, Saddam. This really is the most astonishing. There it goes. There it goes. I don't understand a word of Arabic, but I think I know what they're saying. Death to Saddam. Death to Saddam. Statue is down and now they're squashing it with their feet. Pounding it with their feet, pounding it with their hands. Death to Saddam. Is that what you're saying? Good, good. Huh? Very good. good. Death to Saddam. Very good. Yes, good Saddam. Yes, good, yes, good. What a moment. We've said this many times in our lives, haven't we, at moments like this, that there'll never be a day like this. Well, believe me, having covered the news for the last 40 years, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. The death of Saddam Hussein symbolically toppled by the Americans at 10 minutes to 7. On Wednesday, the 9th of April, they've come in 350 miles from the south. Despite Saddam's threat of a ring of steel around the city, despite Saddam's threat of a human barrier to stop the Americans coming in, they have arrived. And you know, not a shot has been fired in anger against them. How about that? But coverage of the war demonstrated some of the limitations of the presentation style. Single-handed presentation in a studio that was custom-built for appointment-to-view bulletins. So, in 2004, the channel rebranded again. New formats, new presenters and a state-of-the-art virtual reality studio. It's the dramatic end to one of the most bitterly contested presidential elections ever. Has John Kerry done enough to win, as the Democrats believe tonight? Or will George W. Bush retain the White House for another four years? Welcome to Washington. Tonight, two men are head-to-head -head for the most important job in the world, the presidency of the United States. As you join us, the first polls have begun to close, and the first projections are in. Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky have all backed George W. Bush again, while Vermont voters have got behind John Kerry.
Well, throughout the night, I'll be live here in the Capitol Hill with all of the events, analysis and reaction as it happens. Across this vast country, voters have turned out in record numbers, and in just a few short hours, the full results of that year-long campaign will be known. President Bush voted this morning in his home state of Texas before flying back to Washington. We'll bring you the very latest as he waits to find out whether he'll get a second term. I'm with the Bush camp here in Washington. The polls may be on a knife edge, but President Bush's team say they're confident their man has won. And in the ITV News studio, I'll be here with our panel of election experts. We'll be examining what this means for us in Britain. They call the American president the leader of the free world. What will a President Kerry or a second-term President Bush mean for you? And I'm here in the ITV Computer Graphics Studio where we'll be analysing the votes as they come in and keeping an eye on who's getting closest to that winning post, the magic 270 electoral votes. Hello and welcome to Live with Alastair Stewart. It's 10 o'clock on Friday, the 3rd of September. The school siege in southern Russia continues. Now it's into its third day, with the hostage takers still refusing to allow in food or water. Interrupting that to take live pictures now from Beslan, where it appears this morning, despite that uh, image there of relative quietude, that uh, things are beginning to happen. As you can see at the bottom of your screen, reports of explosions and gunfire near the school siege. I'm going to pause because you can hear it. Draw your attention to the uh, box at the left-hand uh, bottom corner of your picture. These are live pictures and those are live sounds of what is going on around that school at the moment. We are back to the school now, which Jonathan, leads me to Jonathan, underline the point the that helicopter. is at the bottom of your screen there. The school roof has partly collapsed. Interfax, which is... The Russian news agency are saying the roof of the school in southern Russia, where hundreds of hostages were being held, has partly collapsed after a series of explosions. As people at home are reading there, Martin, that uh, a group of naked children are seen fleeing from the school and there's a child literally being carried out as we look there. Just right in the centre of the screen, two men and a woman running there, was a child was being carried from the school. Um, hopefully uh, to safety. These um, are more children, they're right in the middle of the screen to the left of the blue van, a naked child, another one to the right. These kids are alive, that's about the only good thing you can say for them. They're out of the school, they're alive, they are naked, starving and dehydrated. But the amazing thing is they're still running uh, after three days. Uh, Teenager haven't... there, young girl rushing across two of them, Soldier points the way. You're out. You're safe. Go there. Julian, where are you? Tell us what's going on. Hello? Yes, Julian, we can hear you. Tell us yes, what's okay, going on. Can... Uh, OK. Sorry, I'm sorry about this. I'm inside the school, and you can probably hear that there's fighting still going on. The scene is really extraordinary. The building is heavily damaged. Uh, the, the, the gymnasium, which makes up one wing of the school, has been burnt out completely. And until a few minutes ago, until a few minutes ago, when the fighting started again, there were firemen attempting to put the fires out. All around me, we're crouching behind one small part of the building, and all around me are emergency workers and soldiers crouching down behind any piece of cover. The Chechens have been driven out of the school itself, so there appears to be some... That's a rocket grenade just going off. There appear to be some holding out on the far side of the building. And there are Russian armoured cars fighting, firing at them. There's one armoured car on this side, in other words, the main entrance of the school, which has driven right up to the entrance of the school and practically smashed into the wall. In case you've just joined us, this is what has been going on in the last hour or so in that town in southern Russia where the school siege appears mostly to be at an end. Our correspondent Julian Mannion is inside that school. He's been right in the thick of the fighting. We've heard masses of fire. You can hear it again now. Let's just go straight back to him. Julian, what's going on? I'm still, I'm still inside the school. I'm not actually inside in the sense I'm not in the courtyard, but I'm actually inside a room which directly gives on to the courtyard. We actually climbed in through the window to take cover from some of this firing that was going on. Now, what I can tell you is a dramatic development. Our cameraman, Sasha, has, uh, has managed to get very briefly inside the gymnasium where most of the hostages were held uh, and which is now a smoking ruin with the roof collapsed. Um, he says, 
I didn't get that far, and Sasha was thrown out by the Russian authorities within a minute or two of getting inside there. He says there are, in his estimation, approximately a hundred dead bodies lying on the charred and smoldering floor of that gymnasium. That is his estimate. He says a large number of dead bodies are lying inside the gymnasium, which is where, as we know, most of the hostages were being kept. I think both Sky and BBC did pick up one or two tricks from the ITV news channel, notably in the use of sort of top uh, terrestrial presenters on ITV news channel, which the BBC have been rather slow to pick up on, but are now doing, I think. And also with the appointment of you programmes like the Alistair Stewart show, um, which I think is part of what encouraged uh, Sky News to look at... Uh, more presenter-led programming. Well, the reinvigorated channel certainly made an impact and won a range of prizes from the industry, including the Royal Television Society's Presenter of the Year Award, which I was genuinely honoured to receive. But despite that kind of success, we were still having a real problem in making an impact in the ratings. And yet, you know, whenever a really big story broke, they did turn to us. And when London was bombed in July, we began the coverage, and then ITV1 cleared its schedules to carry our coverage, and it turned into the longest-running breaking story in ITN's 50-year history. Right, I'm going to bring you some breaking news you can see there at the bottom of your screen. There has been an explosion at Liverpool Street Station in the city of London. Uh, that, according to British Transport Police, uh, emergency services have been called to the scene. Uh, I can see a red double-decker bus. The front of the bus has been totally destroyed. It's been ripped apart by a bomb. There are walking wounded. The police and paramedics are helping them into cars and ambulances. There are helicopters in the air. Um, there are fire engines all around. Uh, it's a state... Uh, it, it, it's, it's shocking, actually. It's shocking to see. Good morning. Welcome to the viewers on ITV1. You're joining the ITV News Channel because there is a major incident in central London today. No, I think you can uh, now see on, on your screens, this is Russell Square, and that, I think, uh, on the side of the screen is actually the bus that was hit by the blast. The reports that we've had uh, from the scene suggest that the bomb was on the bus, that it ripped the roof off the bus. It was very recognisable. And I think that that's what you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. It would appear that that looks like the roof of the bus that's lying off and towards the side where the tree is. As a barrister, all I can say is, you know, I wait for the evidence before I can make any or jump to any conclusions as to who it may be. But I, I, all I can say is, you know, whoever is responsible for it, and I take pity on them. You know. Pity? Yeah, pity. Because whoever has perpetrated such a wicked act you know, needs pity, really. I need you to move this way, please, as quick as you can. People started saying prayers, praying to God. They struck in the rush hour, targeting London's commuters on this bus and on several underground trains. A tactic designed to cause maximum casualties and disruption. It was the deadly attack this city had been dreading. Hello, it's four o'clock. I'm Steve Scott at Russell Square in central London. And I'm Felicity Barr at Tavistock Square. The day after the London bombings, these are the main headlines. The other big story of 2005 was the tsunami. ITV News Asia correspondent John Irvine was amongst the first to file an eyewitness report. Myself and my family who are here on holiday, obviously we're on the beach and I, I noticed uh, a line way out to sea. I reckon it was about a mile out. It was a line of what looked to be white foam and we had no idea that there'd been an earthquake and I ran into our, our beachfront uh, bungalow and look, to look for a camera. I guess I spent a minute looking for it. I uh, couldn't find it. And I, I came back out again, and, and the guy who runs the hotel was screaming at people to get off the beach. I looked out to sea, and I guess at this stage, it was about 100 yards, maybe 200 yards off the beach, this, this wall of water heading our way. And my wife screamed to me. She grabbed our, our daughter, Elizabeth, and... Uh, I, I looked frantically for my five-year-old son, Peter, and he was, he was looking out to see. He was mesmerized, hypnotized by the wall of water that was, that was heading our way. So I just sprinted for the, for the boy, and I grabbed him. And my wife yelled to me to get into the bungalow, but I knew that 
Peter and I wouldn't make it, so we, we headed at right angles from the wave, and I just ran as hard as I could, you know, and then I could hear the rush behind me. I looked behind, and I could see the wall of water coming towards us, and eventually, when we were, I suppose, 25 yards, 50 yards from the beach, the, the, the wave caught up with myself and Peter, and it washed us, uh, guess another 50 yards into a mangrove swamp. Our correspondent Martin Geisler is there. We can speak to him via video phone now. There are some estimates that on one island, for example, 10,000 are missing and several days on now, we must assume that many of them will be dead. The government are desperately, desperately keen to play this down here. They say that people may have, uh, you know, when these waves struck, run off into, into the jungle. In the last few minutes, we've received dramatic new pictures of the moment the tsunami struck. Jesus Christ, look at that. I know, I can see it. That wave oh is a good God. 15, 20 feet tall. Easy. Get in, get in, get in! But to give you an idea of just how much force it hit that coastline, here, the hotel flagpole snapped just like a matchstick when the tsunami smacked into the coastline behind me. It's hard to imagine just what happened here. Sometimes pictures aren't enough. I'm standing about a kilometre from the beach front. And even this far away from the initial impact, houses have been flattened, leaving only a lifeless wasteland. It all went wrong because uh, the ITV News Channel was always the third player in this marketplace. It was always the smallest, it was always the least well resourced, um, and it really couldn't punch its weight against Sky and against the BBC. And ultimately what's happened is Freeview, the platform Freeview, has become so successful that spectrum capacity on Freeview is so valuable that basically ITV has decided its money is spent better somewhere else other than news. The staff have been the heroes. I mean, they were pushed to extraordinary sort of technological limits when we introduced new technology. They rose to that challenge. There were constant rumours pretty much from the day it opened that it was going to close. And people produced really an excellent service on low cost. And I think they should you know, have their heads high today that they, you know, in difficult circumstances, produced a service which independent people have said punched well above its weight on the air. So that's the end of five years broadcasting as the ITV News Channel. Our thanks to all our contributors, studio and production staff, to all the reporters and correspondents and everyone who made the channel the professional and effective operation that it was. But most of all, you, our viewers, a big thank you to each and every one of you. We hope we've both informed and occasionally entertained you over the years. It was our mission to bring you the fastest breaking news and the most comprehensive analysis. We hope that you'll think we succeeded. <laughs>